So, uh, before we get going, I wanted to cite my sources here. Um, although I have uh, been reading a lot of different things, the primary thing that I have been drawing from is this exegetical, exegetical commentary on the Old Testament by Daniel uh, Block. Um, it had some very good things. I got the outline from it, for instance, and I just really liked the way that it did it. So we're, typically when we do a book of the Bible, I pick somebody's outline and I, that I really like, and I really liked that one. So the, just a recap on the structure itself, the introduction being verse 1, um, the judgment before what they did wrong, verses 10 through 10, and 2 through 10, uh, and then the charge, what they actually did wrong, uh, verses 11 through 14, then the bad good news, and then the good good news, and we'll get to that later. Um, tonight we're just looking at the introduction, um, so hopefully it won't be overly long tonight. So I brought up last week the thing about there's an argument going on about whether Obadiah is prose or poetry or maybe a mix of the two or whatever. Here's the thing. I, 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 did, I don't want you guys to get the wrong impression. Whereas when you're reading the Bible, genre really does matter, like whether it's historical or whatnot. As it applies in this discussion, it really doesn't – it's like irrelevant. It really doesn't matter too much. It's more of an issue of formatting it. So you might say, well, why even argue about it then? Well, because – if it's poetry, you can – you can. when something's poetry, you can kind of diagram it a certain way, and it helps you to understand it. But mostly this is an argument about the format of Obadiah, not really the genre of Obadiah. So it, I probably shouldn't even brought it up in hindsight. It's just not really that relevant. It's something that scholars like to debate about, but they like to debate about a lot of stupid things. So, I mean, whatever. Um, and I also neglected to mention that Obadiah himself, although he was a um, part of the poor, poorer class of, of Judah, the ones who were not taken into exile, um, we do also know that he was educated in scripture and prophecy. He, he actually cite, um, you can see a lot of um, influence from the prophets especially, which we'll actually be seeing some of that tonight. Um, and so I'll go ahead and read Obadiah. Verse 1, so we all know what the heck I'm talking about as I go through the next these next couple slides. Obadiah, uh, verse 1, the vision of Obadiah. This is what the Lord God says concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise, and let's go up against her for battle. So let's break this down a little bit by a little bit. First off, this is really the only um, thing that's said about Obadiah. The vision of Obadiah. Okay, <laughs> like just okay. <laughs> it doesn't say the Obadiah son of or anything. Um, and so then the next thing is it says here that that what's contained in this book is a vision. Now the word translated as vision can really have a wide range of meaning, all the way from a supernatural vision, a vision like something that's not really here that you're like seeing. Like let's say for instance uh, when Paul, you know had his vision of heaven, or when Isaiah had his vision of heaven, he wasn't, you know, uh, seeing something in front of him, he was seeing something supernatural beyond. Or it can also apply to more physical seeing, like, I am seeing the table, I'm seeing Gracie. Um, but uh, here, it seems to be more of, now, this is where, let me, let me say that differently. If Obadiah is talking about what's about to happen to Edom, then it would probably fit in that first category of a supernatural vision. But if Obadiah happened just after Edom's fall, which a lot of people think, it's about divided, then that means that vision here means more of perception, understanding. The point being the vision of Obadiah, that Obadiah is looking at, at, at a recent event, and he's given this special insight into what's going on. Um, the next thing to point out is it says, this is what the Lord God says. So Obadiah, throughout throughout this book, is, is very, very careful to continually point to the fact that he is citing God, that this is from God. Um, he does this to, to prove his point, to, to get it across that he is um, not speaking from his own strength. Um, of the 21 verses of Obadiah, which is very short, the word uh, Yahweh appears seven times. It appears seven different times in the 21 verses, and the reason why he does this is twofold. First off, 
this is a way of highlighting that God is the source. He's not just coming up with stuff. He's not speaking of his own authority. This is something that um, has power behind it. And the second reason is because um, God is claiming authority in this chaotic situation. You have to kind of see it as if you were there. Okay, so here you are in Judah. A nation comes against Judah. It destroys it. You're flabbergasted until you take into account what the prophets had said, that God was the one who was bringing by this judgment. Okay, so then you get down to Edom, and you see that God is the one who is punishing Edom. He's the one who's behind this. He's the one who is raising up the nations against Edom, just like he did against Judah. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. So before I go any further, this is a map of what's going on. Hold on. Yeah, this is a map of what's going on. I don't remember what website I got it from. Super sorry about that. Just pulled it up some, somewhere on a Google search. I, I don't really remember. But you can see here this red area is Edom. And Judah was uh, the area. So Philistia, that's the Philistines. They're, the one, they're along the coast there. If you go like south, let's see, north, southwest. If you go southwest, like past Kadesh Barnea is Egypt. Okay. So... Up there on the right is Ammon on the other side of the Jordan, on the right side of the Jordan here, or the east side. And then Moab is south of south of Ammon, and Edom is south of Moab. So those are the three nations there. Um, Judah is here, along the Dead Sea here, and uh, there's like a hill country, and there's a desert in the south and whatnot. Um, and then if you go north is where Israel was, um, and then if you go further north, you have like Tyre and Sidon and that kind of stuff. Uh, so Judah at this point is is destroyed. So Edom is pushing out into Judah's territory, and that's kind of part of the setting of what's going on. So in the book of Obadiah, it opens up saying, "This is what the Lord God says concerning Edom or about Edom." Um, that's one of the few times that he actually says Edom because the a, a big point that Obadiah is trying to get across is he calls Edom Esau, tracing back its ancestry to Esau, the brother of Jacob. And the reason why he does that is because he's trying to highlight just the betrayal that's been going on and why what Edom has done is so very wrong. Um, in the in the law, I believe it's in Deuteronomy, um, God makes it absolutely clear that Edom's land was actually given to them by God, just as Israel had been. And that was actually um, one of the things that God stressed because he did not want them to fight against Edom because he had given them that land. And so here, this comes up again. God had revoked Judah's land from them, and he is revoking Edom's land from them. Um as far as Edom and as, an, as a nation, we don't really have any records from them. Like the Philistines, if you've probably heard people say, oh, you Philistine, it's a way of saying you uncultured person. And the reason for that isn't, isn't saying that Phil, Philistia didn't have a culture, but they didn't have a record, written record. Much is the same as, as Edom. The, the Jews, for instance, had the Bible, the history of their people, you know. Um, and then they have the intertestamental books like, you know, First and Second Enoch, you know. But here, or I'm sorry, First and Second Maccabees. Um, and but here, um, we don't really see Edom having that kind of a history, which is interesting because the Jews actually recorded Edom's history for them in the Book of Genesis. Uh, at the beginning when it's talking about Jacob and Esau. And then again later it talks about the, the tribes, or the chieftains, I guess you could say, of Edom. And then again later in the book of the law, I want to say it's um, Numbers, it gives a little bit more history about them. And then throughout the history of Israel, it kind of references history to Edom there. So um, kind of interesting there. Typically when the only source you know from a nation is their enemy, that's typically not a good thing. <laughs> But uh, Israel seems to have a more or less a, 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 a good view of Edom all throughout their history. For instance, um, Jacob was the one who started a fight with Esau, taking his birthright. You know, he was the one who, who, who went and lied to his father. His father tries to, go, tries to go against what God had decreed, and everybody else is doing the wrong thing in the story. But Esau is almost, almost not he's not blameless, but he's almost blameless in the story. And then when Jacob comes back from working for his uncle, he's the one who has an attitude problem. Esau has totally moved past it. He's just like, hey, welcome back. 
You know, and it's like Esau is shown as in, in very good light throughout. Um, but the problem in Obadiah isn't Israel's, I mean, Edom's ancient history. The problem in the book of Obadiah is Edom's recent history, the recent things that they've done that's wrong. So then the next thing it says, we have heard a report from the Lord. So the question obviously being, who is we? Well, there's two probable um, solutions that I can see. The first one being a group of prophets. Either the prophets have seen or um, maybe um, certain people who are listening to God at this time who are, I guess you could say, devout God followers. Um, that's probably who the we have heard a report from the Lord. It's probably not Israel as a nation since, well, they're mostly dead <laughs> um, and probably not Judah um, even the people who are left in Judah because they were kind of not really um, I guess you could say they were they were religiously spent and they, they weren't they had didn't really have a whole lot of hopes so they weren't really seeking God um, Jeremiah uh, says and we're gonna look at this this is on this really closely relates to a prophecy by by Jeremiah and in his prophecy he says I have heard a report and in Obadiah it says, we have heard a report. So maybe he's saying me and Jeremiah have both heard this report. Um, as Obadiah very much so does borrow from Jeremiah. And we'll look at that in just a minute. Um, and it's probably not some heavenly council who's talking here. Um, because it says very clearly here, a messenger has been sent or an envoy has been sent out. Um, because it says that the messenger came to the nations and said and said this message to the nations. So it's probably not a heavenly council that's the we have heard the report. And it's probably not the nation itself or the people there. It's probably either the prophets or uh, people, uh, certain select people who are seeking after God that have heard this report. Um, so we have heard a report from the Lord and a messenger has been sent among the nations saying. So this is not Obadiah. It's not the prophet. It's not God. There's someone in between this envoy or messenger who's come and said this message. Um, most likely this is an angel. So we don't really have to make anything weird up or anything. Um, when, with the first time reading through it, but I was like, wait a second. So there was a messenger who said that the messenger came about, <laughs> but it's not that complicated. So, so what is the message that this messenger is saying? He says this, arise and let's go up against her for battle. So this um, sentence can actually be read two different ways, and I'll talk about that in just a second. The main point being the message that this envoy is giving is that the nations are to rise up against Edom. So just as with Israel, God was calling nations against Edom. This is, this is nothing new. We've seen this before. Um, it's, it's, it's not nothing like out of the real strange there. Um, but the but the interesting thing here is that you know once again, looking at their history and how God, God allowed them to be destroyed, as that was God moving. Sometimes we want to say that it's only God working if it's something that we like, um, but it, it, God very much so takes the I don't know you guys, I guess you could say the blame or the whatever you want to say. He makes it clear that he's the one who does it. So then when Edom comes along, and Edom is, is about to be destroyed, or just was destroyed, however you understand Obadiah, um, it, it, God makes it absolutely clear that he is the one who is calling the nations against Edom. He is the mover who's behind things happening. Um, it, it would have been a lot easier if you know they just blamed it on... Um, on, it was just happenstance, or you know, luck of the draw, or you know, uh, we just uh, it was our time or something. But no, in Obadiah, God makes it clear that He's the one who's doing this. He's He's moving the nations. And the interesting thing is that the nations don't even seem to be aware of this. You know, they don't, they don't really seem to even know this. So you know, God's saying, "Okay, rise up and, and attack Edom," and you don't really hear in any of the other people, "Yeah, we serve Yahweh now," um, but yet they're still doing God's bidding. Um, which has serious implications for does anything happen without God's um, encouragement, I guess you could say. And that's not for us to talk about today. So let's look at this at this sentence, the, what, what the messenger, the envoy has said. The two ways that you can read this is as one single sentence. Arise and let's go up against her for battle. That's the single one here. Rise up, let's go against. Or it's it can also be read like this. 
arise, which or, or rise up, which is one word, and then the nations responding, yes, let's go up against her for battle. So if it's that one, yes, let's rise up against her. The, the, it's the nations responding to heaven's messenger that, yes, you have spoken for us to do this. We are going to do this. Um, if it's the second one uh, where it's just one sentence, the speaker speaking, then it would just be heaven's decree. Rise up. Let's go up against her. So the question being, um, who's the us that's going up against? If, if, if this is something where, where it, heaven is going up against Edom, that kind of doesn't sound real good. I mean, to have Edom and all of heaven coming against you, jeez, <laughs> uh, probably not the best of things. Um, but it says here, and a messenger has been sent among the nations, saying, "Rise up." So that seems to say that if it if it is one sentence, it doesn't really make sense unless the messenger is saying, "Yes, I'm going with you as we go up against Edom." It doesn't really make much sense. Um, and then another reason why I think that it's the nations responding to the messenger is because it changes person from uh, first person to, um, what is that, uh, second person or whatever, oh, rise up, and then it switches person to let's go up against her for battle. And uh, so it seems to imply that because the person is changing, that the, um, that the speaker is also changing. So it would be rise up, nations. Yes, we will rise up against her. Um, my own personal thing, and I obviously just gave you reasons for why I believe that, but, you know. Um, then the next thing, which people kind of make weird, and it doesn't have to be, is at the end of this, it says, let's go up against her for battle. Who is her? Now, um, some people think that there's something going on, and I've posted it here at the very end. It's very unlikely. But they think that it's a reference to Tiamat, who was actually a, um, a female goddess uh, among the... Um, Canaanite area, I guess you could say. I, I don't really see that. It doesn't really seem to fit with the rest of the book. It, it doesn't really make sense. But then you're left with the question of Edom wasn't a she, it was a nation from a descendant who was a he. So how do you get she? Well, in in terms from this, this time period, um, it was common to call a geographic location by, a, by the feminine. So the area. Um, so the the idea there being that it's talking about the land of Edom. Now, it should be pointed out as well that this focus, as often is in the ancient records, is on excuse me, is on invading the territory, not attacking the people. Obviously, you would say, well, aren't you going there to attack the people? Well, yes, but that's just how they talked back then. So you kind of have to take it with, from their perspective, not from your modern uh, way of saying things. Um, so the the idea here is the, the, the focus is on the land of Edom, not the people of Esau. Um, so it doesn't really make that big of a deal that it's a her instead of he. It doesn't have to follow the gender um, that we kind of... Uh, associate in now. So uh, I, I've referenced that there's I, I've not referenced I, I've made made claim that um, Obadiah relies strongly upon the other prophets and I'm going to give you a couple examples tonight. The first is um, his the word usage that Obadiah has um, very much so mirrors Ezekiel. He uses a compound a compound form of the Lord God that. It appears some 230-something times in the Bible, and 170 of those times is used by Ezekiel. And Obadiah uses that same compound Lord God form. Um, and this, remember, Obadiah is prophesying right after Ezekiel by like 20 to 30 years. So it, that seems too big of a coincidence. It really seems like he is um, drawing influence from Ezekiel. Then another thing is, um, if you compare Jeremiah 49.7... Um, 9 through 10 and 14 through 16 uh, with Obadiah 1 through 5. So I'm going to read Obadiah 1 through 5, and then I'll read Jeremiah, and you can kind of pick and catch up on, on the similarities. The vision of Obadiah, this is what the Lord God says concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise, let's go up against her for battle. Behold, I will make uh, you small among the nations. You are greatly despised. The arrogance of your heart has deceived you. The one who lives in the clefts of the rock on the height of his dwelling place, who says in his heart, Who will bring me down to earth? 
though you may though you make your home high like the eagle, though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. If thieves came came to you, if robbers by night, oh how you will be ruined. Would they not steal only until they had enough? If grape pickers came to you, would they not leave some gleanings? So now let's flip over to Jeremiah and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Give me just a minute. Jeremiah forty nine. I marked it, and then I forgot that I marked it. Okay, Jeremiah 49, starting in verse 7. Concerning Edom, this is what the Lord of armies says. Is there no longer any wisdom in Timon? Has good advice been lost by uh, lost by the prudent? Has their wisdom decayed? And now let's hop down to um, 14. I have heard a message from the Lord, and a messenger is being sent among the nations, saying, Gather yourselves together and come against her and rise up for, uh, rise up for battle. For behold, I have made you small among the nations, despised among people. As for the terror you cause, the arrogance of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock, who occupy the height of the hill, though you make your nest as high as the eagles, I will bring you down from there, declares the Lord. So you can see very clearly the, the I mean, it's almost word for word. And then go back to verses 9 through 10. If great pickers came to you, would they not leave gleanings? If thieves came by night, they would not destroy. They would destroy only that, only what was sufficient for them. But I have stripped Esau bare. I have uncovered his hiding places so that he will not be able to conceal himself. His offspring have been destroyed along with his brothers and his neighbors, and he no longer exists. So you can see there's a very strong similarity there. Um, Obadiah is obviously, very obviously, drawing from Jeremiah either for inspiration or just to back up his point. But either way, this is what we're left with. Obadiah's uh, prophecy carries a greater weight because he's combining multiple prophecies. This is what the prophets, who are sent by God, saying to you. So it's like it's like this this multi-tier condemnation. You have God, the the one who's sending all the prophets, multiple prophets saying the same thing. What that means for you? So you, you kind of have this 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 I guess you could say cascading thing that's happening. So it carries a greater weight. Um, in, in the prophecy. So whereas Obadiah is, is a very short book, it uh, nevertheless claims a very powerful message. Um, it's very interesting because a lot of the prophets will have like a series of prophecies against different nations, you know, like concerning uh, Moab, concerning Edom, concerning, and they'll go through all these different, you know, nations, but Obadiah is just against one, this one thing. And a lot of it um, is very similar to the other bigger prophets, sets of prophecies. So um, we'll stop there, and next week we'll start making some serious progress through the book. Uh, any questions about the lesson? No? Comments? Good. We're going to stop it.